good afternoon, everybody in the East Coast, and good morning to everybody else. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Laura Ganoza. I'm a partner in Foley & Lardner's Miami office. And um, before I give you a little bit of background about myself and my co-panelists, I've been asked to give you some information and some housekeeping items about how our presentation is going to go today. So bear with me for these, uh, important, uh, this important information. So today's program is going to last a little less than an hour in order to be followed by some short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Uh, there's going to be a panel to your uh, left-hand side of your screen, so please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left side of your screen, and we'll respond to those written questions at the end of the program, hopefully if time permits. The webcast console you're looking at can be completely customized, so you can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, and you can maximize the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. And the PowerPoint presentation that we'll be going through today will be available on our website at foley.com in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource list widget. I believe um, FGI is South Florida is also going to have a link to this PowerPoint presentation on their website. And as a reminder, today's program is being recorded. And the recording will also be available on Foley's website in the next few days. So, Just to give you a little bit of background about myself, uh, I mentioned I'm Laura Ganoza. I assist clients and many of whom are in the fashion industry with protecting their most valuable assets, their intellectual property. For 20 or so years, I've helped clients clear and register their trademarks and copyrights, and I've also used my experience as a litigator to help them enforce those rights either in administrative proceedings before the trademark office or in court in actual litigation. I'm also on the board and a very active member of the South Florida chapter of the Fashion Group International, and I'm also very active in the International Trademark Association. And today I'm honored to be sharing this panel with two of my very accomplished partners. So first we have Andy Baum. He's a partner here at Foley & Lardner. For 39 years, he's counseled clients on the acquisition, enforcement, and defense of trademarks and copyrights. His clients in the fashion and apparel industry include Hermes International, for whom he's chief U.S. trademark counsel. In 2014, the best lawyers in America named Andy the Trademark Lawyer of the Year in New York. He's a member of the INSA Trademark Mediators Network, and we kind of know him as the trademark guru at Foley & Lardner. Next, we have Rick McKenna. He'll be speaking first. He's a partner in our intellectual property department with over 25 years of experience assisting clients in protecting both innovations and brands. He regularly assists clients in the prosecution of U.S. and foreign design patents and also in the selection, adoption, and use of trademarks. Rick is very active in the design rights community, volunteering on both the Design Rights Committee of the International Trademark Association and the Industrial Designs Committee of the Intellectual Property Owners Association. So Rick is going to kick us off talking about design rights in the patent area. Well, thank you, Laura. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody. I appreciate your joining us and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. 
As Laura mentioned, I'm going to be focusing my discussion on design patents and, and particularly the applicability of design patents to the fashion industry. So let's talk briefly about innovations because I, I assume those of you on the innovation side in, in, in the fashion industry, that, that's your focus. You always want to come up with whatever that next great innovation is to get people to buy your products. So these, these innovations obviously distinguish your products from your competitors. And there can typically be, you can divide these innovations into two different categories, and sometimes they overlap. But uh, you have your functional innovations and your ornamental or your non-functional innovations. And on the, in the patent world, we protect those innovations that are functional via a utility patent, and we protect those that are ornamental via a design patent. And today, we're going to focus just on design patents, and we'll leave utility patents aside for the time being. One of the reasons why we like to talk about the patent world and, and, and the use of the innovation, the protection of innovations, is that design patents can create an effective barrier to competition and, and protect or, or safeguard whatever time and effort, creative effort, uh, someone has put into developing a unique design or, or feature in their product. Uh, Design patents have become very uh, relevant in, in our uh, business world today, primarily because of the recent Apple-Samsung decisions. Apple, over the years, has done a very good job of developing innovative products focused on design. The function uh, is also quite uh, spectacular, some people would say, and the design is quite spectacular. And they've done a good job of protecting that, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the recent litigation with, with Samsung, and it's continuing to go on today. But there was a damage award recently of over a billion dollars uh, in favor of Apple, and the bulk of the, the legal basis for those that billion dollars was, dam was, was design patent infringement. And it's almost as if the world woke up, or the IP world woke up to design patents after the, that decision, and suddenly pe people realized that if they put the time and effort into creating wonderful designs, which a lot of people do, and if they're very aggressive and proactive about protecting those designs using design patents, there is a basis for uh, enforcing those rights. So what does a design patent give you? Well, it, it gives you the right to exclude your competitors from, uh, and then here's the, the legal part of my presentation, making, using, selling, or offering for sale a product. Those are the, the things that you get the right to exclude other people from doing. And, and this ability to exclude your competitors, this lasts for right now 14 years, but next month the law will change and it will convert to 15 years. So your patent issues, you have 14, soon to be 15 years in which to prevent someone from infringing your patent. Um, what I show here on the right side of your screen is the front page of uh, the Lululemon patent that was for yoga pants, which was uh, also I think is going to be discussed later today. But uh, here you get an idea of what at least the first page of this design patent looks like, and we'll go into detail a bit more about that shortly. So for a design patent, what does a design patent protect? Well, it, it can only protect the ornamental, non-functional design elements of whatever product you've developed. Um, and this ornamental, non-functional, those, those two keywords, we focus on that a lot in the design world, uh, and, and that's what the protection will be limited to. If you try to secure, focus on, on functional elements and, 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 and protect them via design patent, you'll run into problems that, with that. So um, if you've come up with a new innovation, a, 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 an ornamental innovation, it is protectable as a design patent, provided that you can meet two critical requirements. The first is that the design must be new. And what we mean by that is someone can't have done exactly what you have developed. That's usually the, the easier hurdle to overcome is, is the, the, the obligation that the design is new. The harder obligation to overcome is that the design cannot be an obvious modification of existing designs. So look, Using the Lululemon uh, yoga pants uh, as an example, if you think of all of the yoga pants designs and, and various panted designs that are out there, looking at that creative collection of designs, 
the patent office has determined that the design seen in this design patent is not it is more than, than than just an obvious modification of what's been done in the past. So I, what I want to do is show you what was in a design patent. A lot of people have never seen one of these animals before. So what I've done is again I, I've, I've copied excerpts from the entirety of that Lululemon yoga pant uh, design patent. And on the left hand side you see the first page, and the right hand side you see the second page. Uh, the, there's not a whole lot of words in the design patent. It's, it's, it's focused on the drawings, because the drawings are what matter. It's the depiction of that ornamental feature. There really is never any written description in the design patent of what the specific ornamental features are. Uh, very brief written description. The, the time and effort and focus of the design patent is on the drawings. Um, to your right uh, on your screen, you should see figure one. Um, and this is a front view of the uh, of the pants. And when I, I, I when I look at these uh, yoga pants, what I see is the unique elements, is the unique waistband treatment that they've developed here, um, and also the stitching that you see along both the front and the back, which we'll see in a minute. Um, so figure one is a front view, and now you should be seeing uh, the other figures. The uh, figure two is a view of the rear of the pants. Figure three and four are right and left side views. And, and that's it as far as the content of that particular patent. Uh, there's not much to it. Now, there are creative things that you can do uh, when you're prosecuting and developing your design patents to try to separate out and claim different elements uh, in different patents. But in, in essence, what you see there is, is, is the heart of one particular design patent. So, what I want to move to now are some examples of other design patents that, that are from the fashion world. And, and I, I use that term fashion world broadly. There's certainly the, the, the garments and the clothing side of things. And as you'll see in a minute, we'll talk about some other products that, uh, at least in my mind, fall within the fashion world. So what you see here is an example. Someone has developed uh, a cuff design for a short sleeve shirt, and it's uh, a cuff design that apparently would have uh, some sort of cuff link uh, mounted in the uh, in, in the arm opening. So in the drawing there, and you see figure two and figure eight. Now figure two uh, from from this design patent, it's, I think it may be hard for you to see is they have uh, drawn in dashed lines, the placard along the front and the collar and the sides of the shirt. And they've drawn in solid, li excuse me, solid lines, the uh, arms and the sleeves of the shirt, and also the waistband of the shirt. What all that means is that the inventors of this design are only trying to claim, and the invention that they're focused on is just the design of the arms and the waistband of this particular shirt. Um, and then on the right there, you see figure eight, which is, again, a, it's kind of a, a focus a zero in on, on the design element of that uh, cuff on the sleeve. So that's, that's you know, an example of one design patent uh, in, the, in the apparel world. Here's a couple other design patents. Uh, the one on the left, um, some of you may recognize that as the Ralph Lauren uh, cologne bottle. Uh, that's a distinctive or unique green uh, Ralph Lauren uh, design. And the design on the right is uh, a drawing from an Hermes uh, handbag uh, design patent. Uh, so these are some of the design patent examples that are out there in the fashion world. And, and there's obviously lots and lots of different examples to look at. Here's another one. that I, th These are actually two different design patents. Again, these are held by Hermes. Uh, the one on the left is a design patent directed to just the face of a watch not the body of the watch, it's just the face of the watch. And the design patent to the right is uh, directed to the, the casing or the housing for the, the, the watch. And so uh, this protects any watch that has that kind of, of design for the casing, regardless of what the face may look like. Uh, so you could substitute any face inside that casing, and it would arguably be protected by that, that design patent. Another uh, Hermes design patent on the left there is for a belt. And so the, they, they've uh, pursued protection for 
the buckle that you see on the front of that, and they put in some dash lines to uh, show you the environment in which this is used. On the right side, I've this, this is an excerpt uh, of a design patent from a company, Solomon. Uh, make, they make a lot of outdoor apparel. Uh, this is a, uh, an, a portion of a shoe. And what I'm trying to show with this is that, uh, you know, the, the, the fashion world, uh, the apparel world, I should say, is, is, is very broadly defined. And, of course, people can get protection for whatever design elements, whether it's on a uh, high-end uh, article of clothing, uh, like some of the Hermes patents we talked about earlier, or uh, a pair of uh, trail running shoes like uh, this Solomon uh, shoe design that we see on the right. So there's a, a wide spectrum of uh, ideas that can be protected uh, in, the, uh, in the fashion world as a design patent. So a couple of comments about uh, timing for securing your design patent. If you've come up with a new idea, there are a couple of uh, important issues. The first, we, we, we talked about it being new and not being an obvious modification of what's been done in the past. The other really important issue for, from a design perspective is that if you're going to pursue protection in the U.S., you have to file your design patent application within one year of when you publicly disclose or offer this design for sale. So if you come up with the next greatest uh, shirt design, and let's use that, that shirt design that I showed earlier with the, uh, the, the short sleeve shirt with the cuff, uh, cuff link on it, if that's your design and you take that to a trade show or, or march it down the runway at a, at, a, at, a, at a fashion show, the clock starts running at the first time you, you put that out there publicly. And so you have, you have to file your application within a year. Um, that's the outside limit. The, the best recommendation is you want to file your design patent application before you ever march that product down the runway, before you disclose it to the public. That's the best practice that you could follow. So that when, when we looked earlier at the Lululemon design patent, you saw that there really wasn't a whole lot there from a content perspective. So there's, there's drawings of your, pro, of your design, and there's typically seven views, but uh, you saw in the, in the Lululemon case there were only five views that were shown. Um, so, so the number of views differ, but uh, the, the focus of the application is what's shown in the drawings and, and how it's shown in the drawings. Um, we have to identify the inventors, who are the people who came up with this particular design. Um, and that is a legal determination. That's not a determination that you want to reward someone's boss or, or list someone on it because uh, you, you, you want to try to impress them. It's, it's, it's very important that you get the determination of who the inventor is correct. Um, the application is filed. It will uh, sit at the patent office. It will, re it will remain secret at the patent office. No one's going to know about it um, until the examiner picks this up, looks at it, and, and substantively reviews your patent and, and the design that's seen in it. The examiner will look to see what other similar design patents are out there that are in the uh, patent office database and then make a determination as to whether or not uh, your invention is patentable based upon the other products that, that are shown in the U.S. Patent Office. Um, typically, you'll get a first action from the Patent Office in 12 to 14 months. Um, it, it may be that the patent is allowed up, uh, right away. It may be that the uh, office has some objections to some of the drawings, or, or they give you a more substantive rejection. But uh, usually, the whole process is done uh, in 18 months in your typical case. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to note that, that the contents of the application, they remain secret until the design patent actually issues. So back with the example of the, the cuff, the short sleeve uh, shirt example we talked about earlier, if you come up with that design and you know you're going to be launching that uh, you know, six months from now at an upcoming uh, fashion show, you could file the application now uh, and get that, get that process going right away and hopefully the design patent would issue as quickly, you know, shortly after you, you uh, have publicly shown this and are producing it. There is a, the, the cost of design patents, if, if those of you that are familiar with uh, utility patents know that they can be fairly expensive. Design patents typically are not nearly as expensive because, again, there's not as much content in each design patent. Um, I, I have been involved in designing patents that, that the costs are, are far much more than $3,000, but, you know, this it's, is a good... Uh, starting point for your basic uh, one embodiment uh, design patent. So 
my discussion so far has been focused on someone who was going out there trying to, to protect their own invention. And I realize that not everyone on our call today is someone who's out developing their own ideas, but rather they would like to uh, utilize what's out there as inspiration and develop their own products which, which harken back to the designs that, that might be seen in, in, in by a well-known designer. And there is a process that you can go through, and you may want to think about going through, where, of doing a clearance search, where uh, you can go out and search to see who has uh, design patents on a particular concept or idea. And basically, you would you'd contact a, a design rights uh, uh, patent lawyer, and they would do the search of the records of the patent office and try to identify those patents that are out there that are close to whatever concept or design that you want. You can search for the concept, or you can search for patents in the name of a particular individual or company. If you happen to know that you want to do something that's close to a particular Ralph Lauren design, you can search for all Ralph Lauren design patents and see what protection there may be for that those uh, products. So that's often a good uh, uh, recommendation because if, if there is a design patent that has been secured for a particular uh, product like the, the, the shirt we're talking about here, uh, there are damages that accrue if you're infringing that design patent. So as we kind of wrap things up here, I've got a few more things to, to, to show you. I want to give you an idea of the scope of activity for design patents in the uh, fashion world. And the design patents are all classified according to their subject matter. Um, and this is just an administrative uh, classification system that the patent office uses. Class two is where all apparel patents, so that's everything from, from a headband to a hat to shirts, pants, uh, and, and footwear. And uh, dating back to 1975, you see that there's about 18,000 uh, patents that have issued since 75 in this particular area. And I also did a, a, a search focus to see what the recent activity was, because I mentioned to you before that uh, interest in design patents has has uh, peaked recently after the uh, Apple Samsung case. And you'll see that there's you know a little over 1,000 patents that have issued since January 1 of 2014. Class three is where purses and bags are, are organized, and uh, jewelry and ornaments are in class 11, and you can see those numbers there. I won't uh, bore you with reading those. The other thing, that, from a statistics standpoint, I picked names of just a couple of companies to see what, what, how many patents they had and see how active they were. And you can see Lululemon's got 33, Louis Vuitton uh, 80, and Hermes 223. And you'll note I said perhaps more for each of these. The reason I say that is because when you do a search for patents uh, in the name of Lululemon, you're looking for that name as the assignee of the patent, and not all patents may have been assigned to them for one reason or another, or they may not. Um, they may have a different entity name. So that wraps up my discussion. I'm going to pass the baton to Andy, uh, and uh, we'll have questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, Trade dress, that's a, a term that gets kicked around and a lot of people misunderstand. Um, so let's try and figure out what it really means. And I think the easiest way to approach it is to first think about a trademark. Trademark's an easy concept. People understand that when you see Heinz on a bottle of ketchup, uh, you're not going to get Hunt's ketchup when you enter a search into Google. You're not going into Bing. A trademark tells you who it is that is providing the goods or services. It's an identifier. It's sort of like a, a brand name. Um, trade dress serves the same function. Trade dress is uh, a, a feature or a collection of non-functional features which, taken together or singly, signify a brand. It tells you who it is. It's a way of identifying uh, the producer. So it acts like a trademark. And traditionally, uh, or originally, trade dress, the term comes from the way you dressed up your products for the market. So you have a keystone label, and you know that's going to be Heinz ketchup even if you don't see the word. Uh, you grab that bottle, you know it's scope, mouthwash, uh, no matter how late at night it is or what your condition is, if you see that uh, combination of gray and blue on the can, you're going to know it's Red Bull and not Monster Energy Drink, even without seeing the word on uh, on the can. 
And over time, trade dress took a number of uh, forms, and all of which are recognized and protected. Uh, Magazine and book cover designs are recognizable from a distance. You don't have to figure out uh, who the brand is. If you see it, you know who it is. That's true of restaurant designs and packaging elements like uh, Maker's Mark Bourbon, which just won a trademark case. Um, Robin's Egg Blue Box for Tiffany, Orange Box for Hermes. Sometimes the exterior of a product will will, will be trade dress. And all of these, because they're packaging uh, or uh, uh, ways of identifying a product, signal to people immediately that it's signifying a brand. Well, now, what about the entire design of the product itself? Um, that was something of a controversial or uncertain issue until 2000, when the Supreme Court decided the issue and said, yes, the design of a product can be protectable trade dress, but because product designs are not typically or traditionally thought of as a way of identifying a producer, Product designs are traditionally created because it's a pleasing design or it's new or it's original or it is an element of creative expression. We're not going to protect product designs from day one like we do distinctive trademarks. They can only be protected under trade dress theory if the relevant public actually recognizes the design features as coming from a single company. In other words, you have to provide proof that the product design is performing a trademark function. And and this was the Walmart case uh, in the Supreme Court. That was uh, uh, a knockoff case, frankly. Uh, Samara Brothers made children's garments. Walmart photographed 17 of them, sent them over to China, copied them. Uh, and the uh, the problem was discovered when a uh, J.C. Penney buyer found them in a Walmart and went to Samara and said, "Why are you underselling us in Walmart? Uh, you're not supposed to do that under our agreement." They actually thought it was a Samara product. And Samara sued Walmart, and they won at district court. They won in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. The courts found that this. Um, this uh, Samara Brothers look of, of appliques with realistic uh, um, uh, design elements on there was trade dress, um, <clears throat> and they entered an injunction. Uh, Walmart took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that uh, product design is not going to be protectable unless the uh, uh, the owner of the trade dress can prove that people really recognize it as coming from one place, that it really has what lawyers call secondary meaning. Um, and in a product design case, the, the, the barrier is pretty high. Uh, you have uh, obviously want to uh, talk about your sales volume and your advertising, advertising expenditures. It's very important if you're trying to prove rights in trade dress that you can show exclusivity. In other words, that your design element really uh, is exclusive with you. If it's something that you can see from a lot of producers, it doesn't serve that brand identification function and it's not going to be protected as trade dress. Um, I can show you a couple of examples of cases where product designs succeeded and didn't succeed in proving secondary meaning. On the left, you see the chair that's known as the Eames chair, designed by Charles Eames in the 50s. Uh, Herman Miller has been selling that chair under an exclusive arrangement since 1956. And uh, in 2001, after the Walmart case, Herman Miller won a decision against Palazzetti, which was making a knockoff. Uh, There was no design patent protection for the Eames chair. Uh, it's often the case in the fashion and design world. Uh, often you just don't know that a design is going to be valuable enough to warrant a design patent until that magic one-year period has gone by. So there's no design patent on the chair, but Herman Miller put in a huge amount of evidence, not only about the number of sales, but um, reference materials that talked about it as the Herman Miller chair, affidavits of design experts, awards that had been won, appearances on TV shows, 
Um, and the Sixth Circuit agreed that secondary meaning had been established. And now uh, Herman Miller uh, has effectively a monopoly in that design for as long as they sell it. Um, one of the good things about trade dress protection, if you can get it, is that it lasts as long as you continue to sell the product and protect the exclusivity, unlike design patents, which expire after a period of time. On the right, um, you see an unsuc unsuccessful attempt to protect a design. Uh, a company called Bretford uh, had an original design for a computer table, but the court said there's no evidence that that design prompts Bretford in buyers' minds. Uh, you can't protect trade dress just because it's a nice design. And the court said that when consumers value the feature for its own sake, rather than as a badge of origin, it may be copied freely. Uh, obviously, that's qualified by the fact that if there's a design patent, you can't copy it freely. Uh, here's a good example of a case. This is pretty recent. This is from Los Angeles in 2010. And again, this is what anyone would recognize as a knockoff. Forever 21 saw a jacket being sold at Express, uh, copied it. Uh, and Express um, uh, was able to define its trade dress properly. Uh, there was a sort of a passport stamp design there and the design of the zippers, horizontal and vertical, the wide hem. Um, but they lost the case. Uh, they tried to show secondary meaning uh, by saying, well, listen, we sold this jacket in all 576 express stores across the country. Uh, and we sold over $600,000 worth of it. Um, and the court said, well, that's not enough. If that were enough to show secondary meaning, then everything in an express store would have secondary meaning and no one would be able to copy it. And that's not what the law says. Express also said, well, it's pretty obvious that Forever 21 intentionally copied us. They went out and, and copied it line for line. And the court said, well, that doesn't prove bad intent. It's okay to copy what's not protected. Uh, by either trade dress or, uh, or, or design patent. Uh, that doesn't mean you're doing something bad just because you're copying. So it, for secondary meaning, and, and I hear this from clients a lot, they talk about the creativity, the novelty, the aesthetic merit of what they've created, and, and that may get you somewhere in the marketplace. It may get you somewhere for copyright protection, which we'll spend a minute on soon. But that doesn't count for trade dress. All that counts when it comes to trade dress protection is public recognition that the design signifies a single source. Two other things about trade dress. One is that if you're going to assert it, you've got to be able to define it in pretty specific terms. Um, and on several occasions, FUBU once in the early 90s, uh, lost a case against a, a line uh, that they thought was knocking them off called solid clothing. FUBU couldn't really articulate what it, what they were trying to protect. There was certainly a feeling that this second comer was a was a knockoff company, but um, you know things like bright colors and gradient color fades and placement of patches and appliques, sort of the style or the look or the feel. Well, that wasn't enough. Um, and by the same token, concepts and marketing ideas and themes aren't trade dress. When Frusian Gwaja came into the market years ago, haagen couldn't keep him from copying that sort of Scandinavian look and feel. And, and in the fashion business, there was a case uh, in the early 2000s uh, when Abercrombie & Fitch was extra hot and American Eagle was copying things like uh, using the word performance on labels or uh, outdoor or logos like lacrosse sticks or words like authentic and genuine brand and trademark and use of natural fabrics. Uh, Abercrombie and Fitch felt probably rightly that American Eagle was sort of knocking off their concept, but in the world of trade dress, that's not enough. You really have to define your trade dress by a, uh, a single set of uh, terms and elements that are consistent throughout your product line uh, so that the court can protect something specific. Uh, finally, on trade dress, non-functionality, as with um, uh, design patents, you cannot protect a functional feature through trade dress. 
uh, if the design or the uh, collection of design elements make the product work better or make it cheaper to make or make it easier to use, the trade dress laws won't, uh, uh, won't help. The chair on the left may be ugly, and it may perform the function of uh, supporting someone's body, but there's nothing functional about it under, uh, under the trade dress concept. Uh, there's nothing in that that makes it either more, more comfortable or easier to make. Uh, the Louboutin Red Sole is a trademark as a result of the case against Yves Saint Laurent that Laura will be talking about. That's a trademark only when the Red Sole is a contrasting color to the upper. If the upper is red, then you've got a functional issue of the red sole being part of the overall design of the shoe, and uh, you won't be able to protect that. You can register trademark uh, trade dress as trademarks at the uh, at the USPTO. We were able to do that with the Birkin bag. Jockey was able to do that with the uh, inverted Y. Uh, you have to show a great deal of secondary meaning. The trademark office does not like to register product designs as trademarks. Uh, you don't need a registration in order to have protection. You can protect trade dress without it. If you have a registration, though, uh, you don't have to prove secondary meaning. The courts will assume that you've got it already, so it makes it a lot easier to protect. Uh, by the same token, if you do a trademark search and you don't see the trade dress there, that doesn't mean you're safe. Uh, uh, there can be unregistered rights. Uh, trade dress reg as trademark registrations can also be registered with customs, and that can be a very powerful way to keep uh, competitors out. I have uh, one minute left, so I'm not going to tell you what you may already know about copyright, but I want to leave you with one critical thing that people overlook. People often ask me, I want to register my copyright. I want to make sure I'm protected. And registration is not necessary to have copyright protection. What people overlook uh, an amazing amount of time is the issue of ownership. Copyright belongs to the author. The author is the person who puts an idea into tangible form. The employer owns the copyright only if that author is a true employee, someone who probably gets a W-2 <laughs> W uh, and works on site. If it's an independent contractor, it's not a work for hire. And uh, the person contracting for the work has to get a written assignment in order to own the copyright. This comes up in fabric design, which is probably the most important copyright issue in the fashion industry. If you employ an outside designer, don't think it's a work for hire just because you hired that person. The Copyright Act says that uh, uh, fabric designs are not the sort of works that can be protected as a work for hire by agreement, you must get a written assignment or you may find yourself not owning a copyright you think you should own. That's a whirlwind tour of trademark and copyright. I'll pass it on to Laura now to talk about how to enforce these rights. Thanks, Andy. And thanks, Rick, for kind of setting the framework for the types of protections that are available to fashion designers and those in the apparel industry. So now that we know kind of what is out there as a form of protection, how do you enforce it? What do you do once you've gotten the trademark or trade dress registered or once you've gotten your design patent? And so we're going to talk now about some, some cases and uh, how you can enforce these valuable uh, intellectual property rights. And to know how to enforce it, the first thing we have to talk about is what are the tests for infringement. So we have to first understand the standards. And with respect to trademark, the standard is a likelihood of confusion. They want to, the test is to see if a consumer is going to be confused. And so it's a confusingly similar test. It, the courts employ multi-factors, a multi-factor test to see if at the end of the day, the consumer is going to be confused when they're buying one product and they think they're actually buying another. So that's the test for trademarks trade dress. For copyrights, the test is substantially similar. And in this case, the courts are going to look like first to see, first if you have a valid copyright, and second to see, well, is there actual copying? 
And that's a hard standard to find many times. You're not always going to have this smoking gun email that uh, you have someone saying, oh, I loved that design. Let's go ahead and copy it and make it. So many times, since you don't have that actual copying proof, the courts are going to look to see if the user had some kind of access to the original design. And when you have a fashion line out there and it hits all the runways and the photos are all taken, the access you could usually find from that. And then from there, the court's going to look to see if the designs are substantially similar. Then for your design patent, you're going to compare the total, totality of the designs as a whole. So the overall design, it's going to be looked at between the two products to see if they're similar. And it's a test that they look at through the eyes of an ordinary observer. But they also want to make sure it's put in context as to what the prior art is out there. So what has already been out there? And then based on that, if you look at the two designs, are they substantially the same? Now, it's important to notice that none of these tests require the designs to be exactly the same. So you don't have to have an exactly the same design in any of these cases to be able to prove that there's infringement. But there's also no specific percentage rule either. Many times we hear clients and come to us and said, oh, but I've changed it a few percent. I changed it 10%, is that enough? Well, there's no bright line rule of the percentage that you have to change it to make it different. But these are the standards you have to keep in mind. So here are some, uh, a, some examples of how each of these kinds of intellectual property have been enforced in the fashion industry. And one of the um, a prolific enforcer of her copyrights is Diane von Furstenberg. And here are a couple of examples of recent cases that she launched. The first one is against Forever 21 on the left and against Target for her spotted frog design on the right. And if you can't tell, the DVF designs are actually on the left of each of those. And so what she was able to do is that armed with a copyright registration for the actual fabric designs themselves, she was able to sue these infringers and she was able to get permanent injunctions against them. But what's important about these cases is it's the design itself that was protected not the overall design of the dress, because as um, Andy mentioned, you know, it's limited what copyrights will protect. And the design of a dress that is a useful object is not going to be protected in that way. But if you focus on the fabric and get your registrations on the fabric, then you have um, a good uh, an arsenal, a good tool in your arsenal to protect. And there's also been a lot of uh, litigation recently in the trade dress space in the fashion industry. Andy alluded to the uh, Louboutin versus Yves Saint Laurent case. And this was a big deal for trademark attorneys and people that are interested in following fashion law because uh, what Christian Louboutin did was he sued Yves Saint Laurent when Yves Saint Laurent was going to come out with this monochromatic line of shoes. And one of the shoes they were coming out with is an all-red shoe with a red sole. So Louboutin, who actually had a trademark registration for the red sole on shoes, and Andy showed you a picture of what that looked like, he said, well, you can't do that. I have a registration for that. And he sued Yves Saint Laurent. And in the court, the lower court actually decided that, well, not so fast. And they actually question whether this trademark was valid. And this is kind of important because the lower court initially made kind of a sweeping generalization that color per se would not function as a valid trademark in the fashion industry. And the lower court reasoned that color is unique in the fashion industry because color serves a more ornamental or aesthetic purpose than it would in other industries. And the court compared the use of color in the fashion industry to something like the use of pink for fiberglass insulation. That's not, there's, there's no aesthetic purpose to be used a particular color. So the lower court kind of made this sweeping generalization that could have significant impact in the fashion industry. So the case went up on appeal and the Second Circuit reversed that. 
and actually reversed this per se rule and said, okay, you can't just say that. You actually have to have an individualized analysis of what the trademark in question is. And the court looked to, to see the kinds of evidence that was produced as to the secondary meaning that the Louboutin Red Soul created and found that, yes, Louboutin does have the secondary meaning, but only when the red of the sole is in contrast with the rest of the shoe. So at the end of the day, Louboutin was able to keep its trademark and, uh, and in the red sole, but it wasn't able to enforce it against this particular defendant because the court found that the Yves Saint Laurent shoe was a monochromatic red and it didn't infringe because it didn't have this contrast. So this was an interesting, a very interesting case, but it shows that now alive and well in the fashion industry, you can protect the color, but it has to be non-functional and you have to be armed to be uh, able to present evidence of how it is, has secondary meaning and it identifies your goods as opposed to others. And here's another example of um, the ability to use a registration on a trade dress. This is a case that actually Andy recently handled. And there you have the two, um, the Hermes Birkin bag on the left and the infringer's Birkin uh, knockoff on the right. And then you have a picture of what's actually registered as a trademark registration for Hermes. And there's special, there's specific features of that bag that's registered, the distinctive flap design, the distinctive closure design, the padlock uh, design that's there. And the fact that Hermes had this registration made it, gave it the presumption of the secondary meaning. And we were able to go in there and quickly get um, the infringers to stop selling the product and have a permanent injunction against them. And, uh, you know, what, what makes this case important as well is, you know, I mentioned that trademark law is out there to protect the consumer. And, you know, no consumer that buys a, a bag for $20 or even $200 is going to think it's a real Birkin bag. So you're not protecting against that consumer. That consumer is not confused. They know they're buying a fake bag. But... The, it's the other, the next consumer that will see that on the street and the brand reputation itself that could be harmed. So that is why it's so important to protect these um, when you have a signature product like this and to get your registrations if you can. Another case that uh, is actually ongoing right now and is another pretty important trade dress case in the uh, uh, apparel world is the litigation that's going on with the Converse Chuck Taylors. Um, in October of 2014, Nike, who owns Converse, sued over 30 companies for trade dress infringement of their iconic Ch Chuck Taylor um, trade dress. And so here is an image of what they have registered. They obtained it, the registration, in September of 2013, and they went after um, almost 30 other c companies using this. What's interesting is that they claim they've been using this design for over half a century, and they, have, they got this registration recently, though, in September of 2013, and they've gone out and sued uh, a bunch of different companies, and what they claim is basically three elements. They have the toe cap on the top and the toe bumpers in the front of the shoe and the two stripes of the midsole. So they claim they own that. That's their distinctive design, and that should be protected. And here are some examples of some of the infringers that they've sued, including Fila. Now, since the case was filed in October, many of the um, – Entities that have been sued have settled, including Ralph Lauren, H&M, and Fila. And the settlements are confidential, so we don't know what, what exactly were their terms. We believe there's some kind of monetary payment, but each of the companies have agreed to stop using, the, using that trademark and stop 
selling their products. Now, interestingly, what Nike did in this case shows that there's additional ways to protect your um, IP beyond just your traditional litigation in court. While Nike sued all these companies in federal court, they also at the same time instituted what's called an ITC proceeding. Now, this is a really powerful remedy for uh, designers. It's not used very much. It's used mostly, you'll see it a lot in patent cases, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's effective and it's actually available and applicable to any time that you have a trademark or copyright or even trade secret. And what it does is you institute a proceeding with the ITC, which is the International Trade Commission, and it's a federal agency that basically monitors what comes in and out of our country. So it, it monitors what the um, impact of imports are into the U.S. And if something is threatening our imports, like an infringing product, uh, then they will act to stop it. So what's interesting about this kind of proceeding is that it's limited to injunctive relief. So in filing this ITC proceeding, Nike was not interested in getting money damages per se here because you can't. The only remedy that you'll get is a powerful one, but it's limited to just prohibiting the products from coming into the United States. So it's, it's a good um, alternative or many times it's used in, in, as a complement to federal litigation. A couple of benefits are that it's faster um, the trial is actually set in the Converse case in August of 2015, and there is no way that in any federal court litigation against multiple defendants, you would have a case that was filed in October of 2014 to be set and ready to go to trial by August of 2015. So it's a much faster proceeding. And another thing, another aspect that makes this useful is that you could go after foreign parties much easier because foreign parties, you're actually going after what they import into the country, not after the parties themselves. So you could go after many you know, manufacturers that are abroad in China and elsewhere. You could actually reach them through this order. Um, but again, you don't get damages and you don't get a jury trial. But it's another powerful remedy that you could use in order to uh, protect yourself once you do have this IP. And in a design patent case, I, Rick spoke a little bit about the Lululemon case. And so in this case, since Lululemon did have all those patents, it decided a couple of years ago that the Calvin Klein yoga pants that they were selling was way too close for comfort for theirs. And they sued Calvin Klein over those patents, claiming that Calvin Klein infringed their unique waistband designs, and their unique pant style. Um, so the party settled this case really quickly, so we don't know what the court would have done. And so the question is, okay, well, is the Lululemon unique design of the waist truly unique, and does it meet all those requirements that Rick mentioned you need for a valid design patent? So like many of these IP cases, though, they were settled, so you wouldn't know. But here's an example of, a, of an apparel company going out there and using design patents in a way to enforce their rights. And so, as we discussed, there are a lot of rights that are available, but we still kind of lag behind in the United States in having more protection for fashion designs. And some of the people in the industry have recognized this and have lobbied to Congress to try to change the law. Most recently, we had the Innovative Design Protection Act of 2012 that was before Congress. And this was um, advanced much by the Council of uh, Fashion Designers of America and as a way to try to get the U.S. in line with maybe some of the other countries like in Europe, even Australia and Japan, that do have more design rights protection for, um, their, for their designers. The bill kind of stalled and, and it hasn't passed yet, but what was out there was something that would increase the, the standard for infringement so that you do need something more closer to substantially identical. 
but it would give a three-year protection to designs for designers so long as they had a design that was original and unique. So it was a step to, to get that protection. It hasn't passed yet, and it'll be interesting to see if it does because there is debate as to whether um, we need that because some people believe, well, we need, we need people to innovate and copying of designs fuels the demand for people to come up with something new, and so maybe we don't need it. So there is a debate even within the industry as if we need more protection. And the last thing I just want to mention is, you know, some designers just feel like, okay, well, if I can't fight them, maybe I can join them. And some have created with their own knockoff lines and are selling it in stores like Target and H&M. And here's just examples of a couple of them. I know that just last week, Lily Pulitzer sold out in, I think, minutes um, in, at Target when they did their uh, Target line. So this is kind of a way that designers are trying to deal with this knockoff fast fashion problem, and they're trying to get in on it and maybe even, um, you know, to present their designs to a new market for an aspirational purpose. Maybe instead of buying a, a knockoff somewhere else, they'll buy originally in Target one day, and then eventually they'll buy from the designers themselves. So that's another way that the designers have tried to deal with, with all these issues. And I think we're almost at, uh, out of time. We wanted to give time for some questions. So if you haven't submitted any questions, please do so now. I think, uh, I think we have one question so far, and then this one goes to Rick. Um, someone wants to know, how do we search existing patents ourselves? Uh, obviously, it's impractical for us to use counsel for dozens of inquiries. So, Rick, what do you recommend for uh, our clients to be able to do this themselves? Uh, searching design patents, if you're, if you're searching by the name of the owner, uh, is, is not terribly difficult. That can be done with, you know, in, in, with a little bit of training. The, the patent office has a variety of databases that are available. Um, they're, not, they're not terribly intuitive, and there are lots of little tricks that, you, that, that people need to know. But with a little bit of training, uh, virtually anyone can jump on and do some searching to try to identify patent and patent app, but patents by the name of the uh, of the applicant or the owner. It's it's far harder to do this uh, if you're trying to do a search for, uh, again, using our concept of the the, the sh short sleeve shirt with the uh, the cufflinks in it, um, because you have to that has to be done uh, typically manually, where someone's going to go and look through all of the uh, design patents that relate to shirts and or cuffs of a shirt, um, and that's what they would manually be looking for. There is some keyword searching that can be done for this stuff, but you're dependent upon whoever created the database and how they categorize or classified or, or, or put words to whatever that design is. So uh, it's a really tough thing for someone to do on their own. And I, I, I will tell you, on the, some of the design committees that I'm involved in, uh, there's a lot of discussion about what can be done to create exactly the kind of database that I think they're asking for here, which is something that that people you know, in the industry can jump on. They don't have to hire lawyers to do all this stuff. But unfortunately, there really isn't a good option right now. Okay. We have time for one more. Uh, we have one, and I think this might go to you too, Rick. What happens when you have a design patent and utility patent? Can you still obtain trade dress or 3D trademark protection for your product slash design? And, and whoever asked this question, they were not a plant, but they just hit on my favorite topic to talk about, which is the overlap of design patents and trademark rights. And uh, what I try to tell people is when you come up with a great uh, innovation, uh, you know, the next iPhone or whatever it may be, um, go out, get the design patent, and enforce the design patent because, of course, that gives you the ability to, to, to keep competitors out of the market and, and, and make sure that you're the only uh, particular shape of, of that product or that, that garment that's in the marketplace. So you've got that 15-year period of time. And as Annie mentioned, when you want to go and register that as a trademark, then you, um, 
you have this one of the things you have to prove is that, that, that you've been you're the exclusive user of that design in the marketplace well you have the design patent that gave you the ability to have the exclusivity in the marketplace so that having the design patent can be a great benefit for getting the trademark registration because it helps answer you know check one of the boxes that you need to check in order to to get a registration of, of, for the trademark now and then as Andy said when you get that trademark registration, the the term of protection can be for as long as you continue to sell the product. So the, the design patent will lapse after 14, soon to be 15 years. Trade dress protection as a trademark can last for as long as you use it. Now, there's another important issue that was raised in that question about utility patents. And there has to be great care in drafting the utility patent because there is a, a key rule in the in the design patent world that says if you have a design patent, I'm sorry, if you have a utility patent on a feature, that's evidence that that feature is functional and not ornamental. And so you really need to draft your utility patent knowing that you're going to also try to get trade dress protection and design patent protection for this element. And as long as you are careful and intentional in the way you draft the, the utility patent, you can uh, uh, put yourself in the best possible position to be able to also protect certain, you know, the non-functional elements. But it does take a little uh, care in drafting. Okay. Um, I think we'll do one more question, and then um, if there's any other questions, we're we're happy to um, answer them offline. Uh, what sort of vetting filtering process do you recommend fashion companies do internally to determine which design concepts should move forward for patentability? Uh, I think that one comes to me too. I, I think the, the, the real answer to that question is, and I'll, I'll kind of take the easy, the, admittedly the easy way out is, take a look at the design. Is it is it something that is really uh, monumental, or maybe that's overstating it, but, but a, a true step forward, a real innovation, something that's unique and different. If it's an incremental improvement uh, on products that have been out there forever, you know, it's probably not worth your time or effort to, to protect that. But if it's something that's really uh, interesting and, and, and unique, protect it. Um, the, we do have this ability in the U.S. to, to file up to a year after you publicly disclose it. So if you've got a, a product that you launch and it gets rave reviews and everyone loves it, for, and the reason they love the product is because of whatever design features, you know, non-functional design features you put in it, rush out and, and, and get that design patent on file as soon as you kind of get that feedback. So that's kind of the easy way uh, of answering that question, but, but you got to kind of think about what's going to be the, the innovative products and what's going to hit. I, I know if if you had the answers to those questions, you'd be a millionaire, but uh, uh, unfortunately that's the, the best I can do in that regard. Okay. Well, I think we are um, just over our time. Uh, so if anyone else does have questions, go, you know, we could certainly answer them offline. Um, and I think you might be getting a survey or something afterwards about the webinar. If there's any other topics you would like us to discuss in the future, let us know because we're always looking for innovative and, and relevant topics to provide at these webinars. Um, in the meantime, though, you also, we have your con our contact information are provided in the slides, so you could reach out to any one of us to go over any of these things or anything that's still outstanding that you would like to talk about. And we hope you found this in, informative and interesting. And make sure that you uh, reach out and you can get a copy of our presentation and the recording in the next couple days on both Foley's website. And I believe we'll also have a link to the Fashion Group South Florida Chapters website. Thank you so much for your time. And um, hopefully we'll be doing this again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.